open the bottle. Let's let's oh, have some. I'm not on mute. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody to the March 31st Wines Day. Uh, tonight we've got Jeremy from Three Keys joining us, and we've got a awesome rosé from the Loire Valley, as well as a really big full-bodied uh, what Paso uh, red blend. Is that right, Jeremy? It's actually, uh, it, it's California designate, but it ends up being all Lodi, interestingly enough. Oh, wow. Okay. Even, even yeah. cooler. So uh, yeah. nice, and, nice and juicy as we're, you know, transitioning into spring. I think it was a, a fun choice. And obviously basketball season is, uh, you know, nearly finished or upon us or however that fun stuff works. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it makes basketball more enjoyable if you're drinking wine from, from what I've heard. So, uh but we're going to just kind of jump right into it. Um, we're going to start off with the Sophie Breton uh, rosé. Uh, really nice, light, kind of salmon-colored rosé we've got going on here. And give it a little swirl, a little sniffs like normal, and just kind of jump right in. I don't know, Jeremy, if you want to uh, talk about it, I'll actually uh, share the uh, text sheet. So uh, most of my vendors, when I'm looking to bring in wines for the co-op, uh, send me a sheet like this and kind of talks about like the you know, great makeup or great varietals as this says the terroir the soil composition the the whole the ins and outs of the wine on a piece of paper and then uh, hopefully we get to to try it this obviously wine stay is a hopefully great reason to open some wine and to try along and yeah so Jeremy what do you what do you want to talk about uh this rosé with us yeah, so, you know, Eric Louis is, um, his, he's third generation. His grandmother started Domaine de Cuvier Pauline, I believe, in like the late 1800s. And so oh. he's, yeah, so he, he's in his family. And so he's got a little bit of property. In fact, he makes that wine. That's still a wine that's out there, Cuvée de Pauline. Okay. And then Domaine de Eric Louis. And so he's partnered with Sophie Bertin, um, who's a wine merchant in France, and and, and kind of really, and, and kind of really honing into these classic wines from the Loire Valley. So hey Ed, hey guys, how are you? Hey Ed, hey Ed. Um, and so because hey, we're we're, because we're just in Sancerre and a little of the outer lying areas of Sancerre, we're not labeled as such. So we're able to get really quality wine for, sure. you know, a third, a third of the price. Um, right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Zach and I were just talking kind of before everybody joined on that there is Sancerre, <laughs> there is Sancerre Rosé in the market, you know, it's limited and it's always Pinot Noir. Anytime you see Sancerre, Rouge, or Rosé, it's Pinot Noir. And so, uh, and those tend to retail at least 30 bucks. Yeah. Um, so if, if you look at this map, and he's kind of zooming oh, in here. If you look at this map, and he's kind of zooming in here. Noir Valley comes all the way off the Atlantic, and at the very Noir end of it is Sancerre. Uh, we got a little bit of feedback, so I'm not sure. Somebody's volume is up pretty high. Volume is up pretty high. <laughs> is that ours? Maybe. I don't know. All right. Cool. Technical okay. is always all right. Make cool. Cool. Technical is our volume okay? I think it so. Maybe it may be a uh, speaker like your maybe so, uh, your app might be up loud. Are you talking uh, to us? See. Yeah, I'm gonna add Ed, Ed and Lynn, if you don't mind, if you can mute to see if we can figure out, and then if we have a question, just unmute figure out and ask. And then, check, check, one, two. Everybody here, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so Loire at the Valley, end, so we're, we're at right now. yeah, Loire Valley. It's really divided into four regions, and so you have uh, where you see closer to the Atlantic is where we see Muscadet, and then you uh, you kind of get further in, and 
Uh, we see Chinon, Vouvray, Sevenier, and Sancerre is right at the very end of this. And it's just lovely. It's where Sauvignon Blanc is from. It is where it rains. And so you have Puy Fume, where obviously Mandavi and his brilliant marketing term, which we should talk about marketing also, sure. um, you know, took Fume and put it on his Fume Blanc in California. Um, and so in Minitou Ceylon as well, which really, I mean, some of the best and most expensive Sauvignon Blancs come from this area. So these guys are based in Sancerre, and because they're producing some things that are also not allowed in Sancerre Rouge or Sancerre Rosé, i.e. Cot, in this particular Rosé, they're able to do sort of a really value-driven uh, Rosé. So this is 80% Pinot Noir and 20% Cot. Anybody know what Cot is? There's a... Yes, sir? I do. <laughs> Uh, so Cot is the like what super old school name for Malbec. Um, you know we in America know Malbec from Argentina. Uh, however, it's a super classic both Loire and uh, Bordeaux blending grape. Um, you don't usually see it as a hundred percent varietal uh, unless you're in Cahors, which is the southern part of Bordeaux. Um, but in like Jeremy was just saying, in Loire, they grow this Malbec and they use it to blend and give like some earthy and some structure uh, to their lighter bodied red wines. If they're doing that, they obviously aren't calling it Sancerre. Um, and they're also what known for Cab Franc in Loire. So like, that's the other kind of big, big red guy. Uh, we do have some uh, Cab Franc uh, from Chinon at the co-op, which is most of what people associate with Loire. But Loire is such a... Like, long valley and, and river system that there's a lot that goes on there and it's really fun i mean it's sancerre if you've not tried one and you want to spend a little bit more money on a you know white wine then it's an amazing uh thing much like chablis which jeremy and i before the zoom we were chatting about how uh how close sancerre so where my little cursor is right here sure. and, sure. and then chablis which is just yeah. a little bit north of there i want to say it's like 50 miles or something like that and you're getting very similar wines that are just high acid, really crisp and minerally, and just very focused and driven wines, which you normally won't find uh, outside of those areas because of temperature and climate, which we've talked about on other Wines Day Zooms. Uh, but this rosé, I mean, 15 bucks, I think it's pretty stellar, uh, especially that really nice lightness to it and crisp, but fruity and floral and just, I think it hits all the notes. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> no? Thumbs up? I, I, I love this wine. I, All I, right. I, I'm a fan of it. Uh, you know, it, we... Fan of it. Uh, okay, you know, so we're unmuting ourselves. We, we, we think, think it's great. We love it. Good. Good. We're loving it. Good. We also mean to it. interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Did, Jeremy, a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Did you, did you, yeah, go ahead. What was your comment about Sancerre and this wine? So the producer is a Sancerre producer. So the producer is a Sancerre producer. Okay. Um, and this, basically the Pinot Noir is coming from Sancerre and some surrounding areas and the Malbec is coming from just outside of it as well. So if you've ever had Sancerre, so we see Sancerre in the market, always it's white. Very rarely do we see Sancerre Rosé or Sancerre Rouge. Um, and, and so we have one in our book. And as I understand it, they make like 200 cases of the Rouge and it comes and it goes. And, you know, we have it for two months of the year and we're out the rest of the month, the rest of the, you know, 10 months. And so it's just limited production. And to put it in like oh, a just limited limited production. production. Uh, Pinot Noir represents about like seven, seven or eight percent of the wine from Sancerre, meaning the rest of it is all Sauvignon Blanc. So it, it's pretty limited stuff. And so these guys are Sancerre producers and they're making um, beautiful Sancerre, but we don't see it. We just see their little value-driven guys, which we're pretty happy with. 
to and have um, Sarah White is just like pretty high end, is it? Um, yes. So in order to, you know, so the AOC, in order to make the AOC guidelines, they are also required for certain yields. And so if they're mass producing stuff, you know, like say they, their vineyards are pulling a little bit more fruit out of the Sauvignon Blanc or their Pinot Noir, then they're sort of restricted from putting the AOC or the AOC Sancerre on the label. So when you see things like this, you're getting high quality fruit in really great regions, but you're also you're also not, it's not the limited production of their making of Sancerre. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think so. What's that? Uh, so this, uh, we shared this tech at the beginning and then we started talking about math. To understand wine, it, it's really helpful to understand geography and just basic areas of where your wine is actually coming from because it can give you eventually a really great idea of basically why the wine and the grapes kind of taste how they do. Uh, and it's a lot of it is all of, you know, what's called terroir. So like where the grapes are actually coming from. Um, this tech sheet actually touches on terroir, which is pretty great. Um, you know, the clay limestone soil is what Sancerre is known for. They're known for that really high limestone content, which then gives the minerality in the Sauvignon Blanc. So maybe one day we'll do a, a split of Sancerre for Wines Day and uh, we can get a little taste. Um, you know, it's not... Not exactly everyday wine for most folks, but um, these tech sheets can be super useful. It gives you a, a nice little snapshot uh, without necessarily opening a bottle. And then, you know, we get to do wine days and, you know, cheers, uh, drink some, some delicious wine. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, so there's basically three types of soil in Sancerre. Um, and um, Cayo is what it's called. It looks like Cailotes, but it's mm -hmm. pronounced Cayo uh, or Cayu, like that terrible TV show that my kids watch forever. Um, and that, and then there's um, Terre Blanche, and then there's um, Silex. And so uh, Terre Blanche is this sort of clay and li uh, limestone and clay, and um, Cayo is that sort of that really chalky soil that we see, like it's called Kimmeridgian, which is also the White Cliffs of Dover. So when you see that in England, that all that soil comes down under the channel into France. You see it in the Loire, you see it in Chablis, you see it in some regions in Champagne. And that's what we want, that really, really bright chalkiness, especially in our Sad Blancs, to give us a great minerality. But you see it here in this Pinot, and then that Malbec kind of adds a little weight and richness to it. Really lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. I mean, it's a, um, one of my favorite wine descriptors is a word petrichor, and it's uh, I think it, it's a great word for chalky expression. It's the it's the smell of concrete after it's rained. So like the heat of like the hot summer, and then the rain hits it, and there's just that kind of you know, summer smell to it. And I think we just had a little rain here. So I don't know if it was hot enough today, but might be some petrichor hanging out. Um, if you wanna go smell the smell the street and then come back and smell your wine, see if you can get some of those minerally characteristics in there. Um, definitely nicely, I get, again, strawberry flavors too. This is really great, fruity without being sweet or like any kind of cloyingness, uh, which is, is really great. This is gonna do very nicely for us. Uh, current vintage is 2020. That's what we have in the store. And yeah, so uh, any other uh, questions or comments about the rosé? Any other questions? I, I have one. Um, this may be kind of silly, but I thought the white cliffs of Dover were white because of birds flying over them. But apparently you're saying it's in the soil. As I, yes, as I understand it, it's soil. Uh, that sort of chalky soil. Um, but I can dig into that maybe for our next class and have you an answer. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at it. It's a uh, chalk accents and streaks of black. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's a uh, chalk accents and streaks of black. Are flying over that, though. Oh, 
Okay, I think I, I just had the wrong. We heard we heard it was bird. We heard it was bird dung even on me. We're over there. <laughs> it's a lot of birds. Kind of nice to know. All right. I think I froze. I think, yeah, you are frozen. Did I freeze? Yeah, you're good. You're back. You're back. I'm back. Look at that. And look at that great transition. It was like a nice like star wipe, but I just froze in place. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's jump into this awesome red wine we got. One, um, one thing I would like to say about rosé yeah, um, is that we often don't think about sushi and rosé as a pairing, um, but mo a lot of it has to do with rosé and like, like it's it, name all the sushi restaurants in the world, maybe 10% have a great wine list. The rest of them are just like sort of haphazard. Um, so next time you get some fresh sushi, try rosé. And I think that rosé would be like absolutely brilliant with some great sushi. So put yeah. that in your pocket and, as a great pairing. I, yeah, I can totally see that with like, especially like raw tuna, because uh, it has that kind of full bodiedness. Yeah. Breathing again. Oh, yeah. you're frozen again. That's a good face. See. Though. <laughs> How's that? Good. I like your face. Like the other, the frozen face is good too. Frozen face. All right. Frozen face is going away. All right. All right. Cool. cool. Slam dunk, huh? Slam dunk. Are you guys onto the red yet? I think crisis has been averted. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Red wine, slam dunk, unlike my iPad tonight, which was not having it. Um, so, Jeremy, you started talking to me about Slam Dunk, um, partially, obviously, for the, the basketball tie-in, um, and but then, obviously, the wine inside of it is what really matters to, to me and hopefully to the folks who shop at the co-op. Um, yeah. Labeling and marketing is a huge thing uh, in the wine biz, and this, I think, is a really great uh, kind of take on two different tech sheets. Um, One's what more tasting notes, one is more tech sheet. Um, but it's kind of, it's interesting to see the, the genius behind uh, what people like to do. So first tech sheet for this wine is pretty awesome. They are fun, big words, <laughs> mega hit. Bold and juicy, hedonistic. I, I just uh, this tech sheet was awesome when I first uh, perused over it. Still gives you all the same details that you know what what we look for. Obviously, fifty five percent petit syrah. Petit syrah is this really big, like thick, dark grape. Uh, you usually see it giving weight to other uh, California blends. Uh, even Pinot Noir, like some famous ones, might be doing or might not be doing. Uh, and then Zinfandel, which People still can have a, a misconception that Zinfandel is really sweet uh, or white Zinfandel, but then I think in, in this form, uh, it does a really great job and it gives you that kind of juiciness, but it still has some, uh, you know, some, some balance to it. Uh, definitely a good grilling wine. I'm looking forward to you know, this and now that spring has started to, to spring, uh, we're gonna see what we can do. But what, what do you wanna talk about, Jeremy? There's a lot of things to talk about with this wine and like this is the perfect storm of all the things. You know, we see a lot of wines with labels like this that don't deliver. Right. And, you know, and that's, and so if we go back to like label design and marketing and how it all works, you know, we have to throw out some sort of basic statistics. Like 70% of, uh, I, 
I would even say 80, 70 to 80 percent of wine drinkers are women. And maybe as you know, we're like as these as we're learning more about wine, maybe 40 to 50 percent of them are like really comfortable with all the things about wine. It means the rest of them are sort of buying wine on labels and or like talking about, you know, th how things work and the wine industry pays attention to that. And so they they putting up th that's how it used to be. They put up these really cute labels and all these great packages. And as the, the last five years, we've seen like the millennial generation come in and buy wine. They want to know what's going on. Who's making the wine? Where is it from? And they're paying attention to that. We're seeing a sort of switch, a, sh a shift in all of that. But this label does all of that thing. Like it, it hits the, the guy that's like really into basketball. But also the orange is this Hermé orange, which is, or looks like Hermes, right. which is the, like a, a, has its own Pantone color for orange. So the higher end, you know, shopper and, and you know, is gonna know that this orange is them then you put all this killer fruit in here. So the Petit Syrah is coming from Clinker Brick, which is this killer, killer Petit Syrah producer and, uh, and Zen producer down in Lodi. And the Zen is coming from Jesse's Grove Vineyard, which is a 108 year old vine Zen. There is no real designate for old vine in, in the world, you know, like if, if, if it's old, we can say it. If it, you know, if it's 10, 20, 30, 40, there's no real rule to it. But this qualifies 108 year old bush vines in Lodi. You can't get much older than that in California. Right. And so you have these, these wines that are delivering with this product. And it is kitschy in our area because we are right here in the middle of you know, Duke University in the ACC country, Carolina state. But the rest of the world, they're not as slam dunk driven as we are. Right. So it is kind of the perfect storm of, of, of marketing and, and winemaking and great, great producing. And then you see this guy named Mayan Kashetsky. And Mayan is from Israel. And I think he's kind of the fun thing to talk about. Like this guy is really, really, really amazing. He's from Israel. Like he was a paratrooper because that's, that's what happens in Israel. You gotta be in the army for three years, you know, before you can do anything else. And so um, he started making wine and kind of learned and then got a job at Screaming Eagle in California as a winemaker. That's his first foray. I've, I've seen the bottle online. I've, I've read about it. I've seen it show up in a book and the cost was more than I care to talk about. Um, you know, it's like a four or five grand bottle, you know, yeah. for one bottle. And so he was a winemaker for a little while and he's this guy that we've had on for Zooms and, you know, he's just a humble guy. Like he literally comes out of the vineyard. He might have, you know, grapevines in his hand. Like he just looks like a normal guy, you know, that's like hustling. And, um, and yeah, and it's a good story. David Green, he's a, he's a smart guy. He puts all the right people in all the right places. The other person that I think is worth noting here is Kimberly Jones. Kimberly Jones is, there's no other way to put it. And so please forgive my French. She's just a badass woman in the wine world. She's been doing this a long time. She used to sell Dave Finney's wines, okay. which is Orrin Swift, The okay. Prisoner. And she was his broker for a long time. And when he sold first to Constellation, then to Gallo, yeah. in true fashion, she got a pat on the back. Thanks for all your hard work. And he got $315 million each or something, you know, like, so she kind of got mad rightly so, and everything that she does and imports and she, she's a partner with now. And so she's making great wines and she owns a piece of all of it. Oh, good. And so this is like a direct stab at the prisoner. It's big, it's juicy. It has that really beautiful vanilla oak. The only difference is it's better wine because it's not like sweet. It's got, it's still got good acid for a red wine as you can see on the tech sheet. Like it's a, it's just the total package. And not to, but I have to say it, it's just a slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I digress. Yeah, yeah, I got, but it's, you know, it, this is all the things, great fruit source, great winemaker, great team, you know, Kimberly Jones is behind the marketing. Oops, sorry, it's my alarm telling me to wake up. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, and it's like, you know, what, 15, 16 bucks? Yeah, 14.99.
both both these wines are you know right at 15 um and this like i think what you're saying for prisoner uh style wine where that patisserie is definitely the driving force or that zinfandel is that kind of you know backup character then this is fantastic like it really over delivers and if you like you know if you want to spend 40 bucks or whatever on a bottle of prisoner go right ahead but there's <laughs> quite a quite a bit out there um that can really give a very very similar profile and cost a third of of what else you can kind of find out there and there's still great winemaking you know uh the orin swift and the prisoner wine company wines like dave feeney obviously knew what he was doing uh, Orange Swift wines are still pretty great. You know, the locations wines are pretty great. Like yeah. he, he knows what he's doing. He's a great winemaker. Um, but it's nice to see other people who are kind of still going after that same style. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not been figured out, you know, and that's, that's the cool thing about wine is that there's so many people out there that really know what they're doing and really just love to jump in and make awesome wine and sell it for a great price. Do you do you know the case counts on this by any? I chance? don't. Um, I, I, I couldn't don't, find it. Don't but. Know. We are about out. We got our. We are getting our last pallet next week. Oh wow! Okay. And, and that'll be it. Yeah. We it's we've had a good run with it. Like I, and honestly, full disclosure, I, I was like, great, we're going for a prisoner style wine. I'll love to sell that. <laughs> and then we tasted it, and we were like, oh, 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 okay. You know, this okay. is 15 bucks, 16 bucks. Like, yeah, it makes sense. And you mentioned grilling earlier, like this yeah. would, if you can spare a little for rub, this will be great on your, on the, on the grill. And then also great in the glass for anything that you're grilling. Sure. Yeah, this is, I think this is going to be, you know, for, for as long as we can get it from you, at least um, a great transition into the really hot of summer uh, where then obviously we'll be drinking. Uh, rosé all the time instead of yeah. more you know opulent red wines like what this presents but in general this is really great I mean just looks really pretty in the glass can't can't go wrong I mean wine people often just pour it into a cup and, and drink it um, but there's a, a lot to it I bet you it's really great with that pizza that's that's what I'm gonna uh, get after <laughs> after we do wrap up wine say today um, but you can see like it's nice and dense like we should Coordinate our food on kind of this of event. Side of things. Um, really, I've got two cats next to me. I think one. Of, you want some more? Um, but eh, no, he didn't care. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. But this I, I thought was a, a really great uh, thing. Yeah, there you go. We've got uh, Jeremy's dog joined us earlier as well. <laughs> uh, Ed and Lynn, I don't believe you guys have any pets. Is that right? No, we, we do not. No, we don't. We, we've had plenty in the past. Or yeah. We're empty nesters now. Right, right. Both with children and dogs right. and cats. Yeah. What is the blend of this one again? It, it is 55 uh, Petite Syrah and 45 it is Old Bond. 55 uh, Petite Syrah and 45 Old Bond. Say that again. The connection is not good. 55 to keep the raw. And 45 old run. And 45 old run. Okay. Old run. Yeah. Thank you. I can, I can send the text sheet smooth. out. I can, I can send the text sheet out. So if, if anybody wants the uh, the information that I've shared, the, the Zoom the information that I've shared, um, and I can send that out to everybody. And I can send that out to everybody. That'd be good. All right. There's my email address. If you're worried. My email address. If you're worried. Right. So another thing that uh, Jeremy and I are doing. Um, Another thing that in the next uh, about a month or so from now, so May seventh from uh, six to eight p.m., uh, Jeremy and I have been working for about oh, a month and a half now or so, kind of uh, going back and forth. Um, Jeremy is is a DJ on the side. I obviously love wine and cheese, um, so we're gonna join forces and do a music inspired. 
uh, tasting. Uh, so we've got three bottles of wine, uh, so two 750s and a, a split of uh, champagne. Uh, I'm working with Josh, uh, which is our specialty coordinator. So he's our cheesemonger in store. And we're gonna come up with uh, you know, music and how it affects your taste buds as you're you know, imbibing these great uh, wines and cheeses. And you know, we, it's really exciting. So I hope that we can see you guys there. Uh, we'll be sending out a big email from our marketing department in the next week or so. And really some, something to look forward to. Uh, hopefully in, it's gonna be May 7th. So hopefully the weather cooperates and we can sit outside and just kind of enjoy uh, the evening as we drink wine and listen to some cool music that Jeremy's been curating for us. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the next big thing we're looking forward to. Um, we also have two wine days in April, so one on April 14th, which will be focused on some uh, Rioja, and then on the 28th, we've got a winery representative uh, for a Slovenian winery, and he's going to be talking about uh, some Slovenian wines that we carry, as well as like the winemaking history and kind of uh, heraldry of Slovenia. So he's, uh, you know, knows all things Slovenia, so it, it, that another thing to look forward to. What's the winery? Uh, it's uh, Klet Brava. It's uh, the Avia brand wines, A-V-I-A. Um, the local rep lives in Asheville and he reached out the other day. Uh, we also, from Jeremy, we carry some Romanian wines. So um, the legendaries, uh, they're full varietals, um, really great wine, great value. And another thing to kind of look on the shelf but does uh, anybody have any other questions about these red wine that we got into tonight? About these red wine that we got yeah. into? Yeah, I have one more that it looks like, and Zach, we talked about it in the store this morning, that the alcohol content seems to be increasing more and more in the red wines. And this one is about 14.8. It used to be, you couldn't get it anywhere close to that. So what, what would be the cause of that? Is that the way they're, they're manufacturing it or whatever? Um, so it, there's a lot of factors that can go into. Um, so it, there's a lot of factors that can go. We've got um, the the biggest uh, the biggest factor is climate and the ripeness of the grapes. So the sugar content of the grapes that is then converted to alcohol, and then winemaking. Um, you know, if you if you harvest earlier, the fruit is less ripe, so you've got less sugars to then convert into alcohol. Uh, typically in cooler regions, you just don't get quite as ripe fruit. Uh, in warmer areas of California, Australia, uh, you'll get really, really ripe fruit that then when you vent it and turn it into wine, you get these, you know, high 15%, 16% wines. Uh, Jeremy, if, is there anything you'd like to add? No, that's, that's it. I think, um, I think region has a lot to play with that. Um, there are some, you know, there are some areas that are adding sugar to uh, increase sort of alcohol levels, and that's called chapitalization. Um, you know, but the, these guys, like Lodi is getting hotter. Um, you know, we can talk about climate change. I, I think this is a safe place to do that. Not everybody agrees yeah. with climate change, but, but the thing that we're seeing is in the, like proof, nowhere else if we think of climate change, the proof is in the vineyard. You look at places like Germany that couldn't grow Pinot Noir that was, you know, not very, it, all of it was very thin and not, not very flavorful. And now they're getting big, ripe Pinot Noirs there. And that's a, that's a sign of climate change. And so higher alcohol levels with warmer temperatures definitely has, has a lot to do with that. Yeah, and, and for climate change, the fact that Britain is growing champagne uh, producing grapes. So they're, they're able to actually grow grapes in Southern England now that they then, because of the acidity and the sugar contents, they're actually able to vent sparkling champagne style wine, which 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, that was impossible. Like it just never, growing seasons and just overall climate, you just don't get it. And now we're seeing just bigger and bigger wines, you know, stylistically, this, this wine I think is going after that Fuller bodied alcohol adds weight uh, to the palate. So it actually adds some, some mouthfeel and some heft. Uh, so for this style of wine, I think they intentionally were 
venting it to be a 15% or thereabouts uh, to get that same kind of like fullness and richness that only alcohol can do. If you've had a non-alcoholic beer in the last couple of months, uh, you know what I'm talking about, where it might taste like beer, but it doesn't feel like beer. Um, same thing with, with wines. You know, you're used to Chablis and Sancerre being 12, 12 and a half percent because it's colder, you get less ripe fruit, you get aka less sugar, uh, and you still are saving that acidity in the grape. Those wines are gonna slowly be changing and it's up to, to winemakers to kind of combat that. And then as, in my opinion, populists to then combat climate change. Um, we're also seeing uh, places like when we did our Bordeaux tastings last fall, we're seeing Bordeaux look into growing non-Bordeaux varietals because of climate change. They're looking at growing Syrah, they're looking at growing Grenache, they're looking at growing wines that, that don't classify themselves as traditional Bordeaux grapes because the traditional Bordeaux grapes are just not performing the way that they used to. Uh, and they've been growing these things for you know hundreds of years. So it's not like they're just, hey, let's try this. This is a, hey, we have to react if we still wanna make make wine, which is kind of kind of scary um, in, in some parts, um, but exciting at the same time that they're actually kind of keeping up with the times. But it's the fact that it, that is what the times are, you know? Um, but, you know, in places, you know, California, just places that make ripe fruit and then stylistically for winemakers. But it's, uh, yeah, we're, we'll see what happens. I mean, every year is different and we'll see what happens. I mean, every year is different and, you know, 2020 was kind of- Has that been a, has that been a, has that been a trend then you think from climate change because that, seems to be increasing over the last two, three years anyway. I mean, I, th I think it's inevitable. If, if the, the, what, where we're, the path we're currently on, um, if you, you have to just harvest early and earlier. When, again, referencing the Bordeaux tastings, um, the harvest and the, like, when they started to pick the grapes was one of the earliest it's been in years. And that's obviously from the grapes being ripe enough to pick in September versus in the last part of September, early October. So things are shifting and it's gonna be up to, you know, winemakers to kind of figure out uh, and field hands and all the, all the, you know, behind the scene farmer pieces of, of winemaking that we often don't think about how to adjust to then still make their product. And, you know, I think agriculture in general is gonna have a big reckoning um, because it's, going to happen unless we can kind of steer everything back in the right direction. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a very broad subject, you know. I think it's a real sign of the times when you take a place like Bordeaux that when you pop that cork and you smell that glass or you take that first sip, you know it's Bordeaux. Like even if all the labels were ripped off, you could taste that wine and go, oh, that's Bordeaux, it's unmistakable. And so, and it's been that way, you know, since the, like, you know, thousands of years, the Romans figured all this out with vineyard, you know, designation, like, and so if they have finally gone, okay, like they've approved seven new varietals in Bordeaux officially. And if they have done that, then that's, that's a sign, you know, like they, we're going to start seeing some different things. We won't see those grapes hit the market probably in for another seven years or 10, but nevertheless, they're making preparations. And I think that's big, yeah. you know, when I, I think when, when we can take away that like sense of place, which is what they've sold for years, you know, that's what makes French and Italian wine and all European wine. When you see, you know, Chianti on the label or Burgundy on the label, you know what you're going to get. And to see them make a scramble for it is big. Yeah. And I even think like to your point about Burgundy, like the richness of Burgundy has increased over the last five, six years. Like yeah. the, the concentration, the lower acidity is starting to creep, more fruit expression is starting to happen. Yeah. And it's not traditional burgundy anymore. It's becoming, you know, it's, it's adjusting to the times, but at the same, 
you know, on the other hand, if you will, it's not what you would typically think of if you've been drinking the same, you know, winery for years, things are, are going to shift, especially in very traditional winemaking situations where they aren't allowed to capitalize, as Jeremy uh, mentioned earlier, or acidify or kind of do the, the chemistry behind the winemaking. It's, you know, putting grapes into a tank and fermenting them with native yeasts and, you know, kind of seeing what it does instead of having to, you know, in order to have a viable product using a lot more uh, science than what they kind of used to do. Um, and, you know, I, I think, again, sign of the times, like the technology is actually there for people to uh, grab onto and to hopefully expand and, and kind of control certain things. But it's, it's just kind of all up in the air. Like who, who really knows what's going to happen? And we're going to start seeing that in the wines that you might have been drinking for years. And then they're going to slowly start to change. And then you might have a memory of something visited in three or four years, and it's going to be a totally different style of wine because that's what the, the you know, that's the produce that they have to work with. I, I do also want to say that the, a, another reason we're seeing higher alcohol wines is because the winemaker or the, the brand is choosing to do that. You know, like as wine sort of got we lost a little sales in the world of alcohol for craft beer, higher alcohol, for cocktails that are these new exciting things. Like some wine drinkers drink wine. And, and I mean, yes, yeah, some wine drinkers drink wine to take it to the face as hard as they can. You know, like I want the highest alcohol wine. I'm going to drink a bottle. I'm going to just like do like I would, uh, you know, three or four drinks or two gravity, you know, 10% beers. And so as that trend has really gained momentum, winemakers are also making a choice to make higher alcohol wines for those folks that want to just have a, a bit better buzz. Right. We're, that being said, we're also seeing a trend with a few, especially in California, there's a handful of producers that are dialing that back right. and making Cabernet at 12 and a half percent alcohol on purpose. You know, like we're seeing this movement, like for those people that want to just get wine drunk, we're seeing people that want to get wine, like, and go back to the elegance of it and like the, the, and how Bordeaux was, you know, and that kind of flavor profile. So it's a, it's a real interesting movement and we're, we're, it's fun to watch for, I, you know, I can only drink so much of a 15% alcohol wine personally, but so the 12 and a half is really entertaining uh, and it, they're fun to find. They're not everywhere, but you can find them. Yeah. And I'd say like old, old, most old world is still staying in that 12 and a half percent thing. Another, I mean, another kind of side to alcohol content is uh, that they're, you're taxed on the amount of alcohol that's in the wine. And if somebody says that it's 14.8, that's a different bracket than 15 would be. And then there's a, a margin of error of what, 1%? So it could be a 15.8 one and a half. Or one and a half. So yeah, I mean, even even it could be a 16% wine, but they are selling it for uh, you know for other tax reasons. Um, this since it's being Californian, this doesn't uh, affect. But the um, tariffs that we were experiencing last year were from wines between 11 and 14%, and then champagne. Um, so that if it was over 14%, the tariffs were not. Uh, charged on those specific wines. So it could be, you know, reaction to the market and to the, you know, to the United States market, like make higher booze wine. That way we can still sell it at the premium that we would like to, instead of having an extra 25%, which is what the tariffs were last year, that importers and uh, wine distributors absorbed quite a bit of that. We saw retail wise, we saw about 33 uh, maybe 50 cents a bottle where the other 50 cents to 60 cents was absorbed, um, which also coincided with pandemic. And it is not, not a good thing. Uh, I believe the tariffs are currently lifted for the next three months. Um, but it also has to affect with goods on water and the whole shipping industry is bonkers right now because half the ships are in the wrong port and the containers are in the other port. And then Suez Canal gets blocked with the evergreen shit. So, you know, everything is crazy right now, but uh, there's a lot, a lot of 
in the wine biz that people don't realize, partly because why would you realize it, but partly that we just don't talk about, you know, wine comes into the store, into the store in a, a cardboard box, I put it on the shelf. You know, that's the very tip of the iceberg for what actually happens um, to get, you know, this bottle from California or the, you know, rosé from Sancerre in France. That's, that's a great discussion about that, the whole increase of alcohol and the reasons why that's happening. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, our next Wines Day is April 14th. Uh, we've got um, uh, so a Crianza and a Crianza Reserva um, that we're going to be showing off. I believe one of the, the folks of the winery is going to join us as well from Spain. Uh, I'm still working on those details, but that's the, the last time I, I touched base. That was what was going to happen. Um, so we can actually meet somebody in, in Spain that made these wines or had a hand in it. Uh, and like I said, on the 28th of April, we've got a Slovenian winemaker or a wine, winery representative. And then uh, May 7th with Jeremy, with songs and good wine and cheese. It's going to be amazing. Uh, look out for more info on that guy. Um, but yeah, uh, Lizzie, did you have a question? No, we just love this red blend. Oh, good. Uh, everybody loved it. Well, both of them, but especially this. And um, we're excited about the next events. We're definitely going to join. Uh -huh. So. Great, and if, if you guys haven't joined before, all of our previous uh, Wines Days are recorded, and we post them on the same website as the link uh, for Wines Day, and you can rewatch. Uh, Ed and Lynn are uh, great supporters of Wines Day, uh, and so you'll see their lovely faces asking some questions in the previous events, uh, and we still have quite a few of the wines uh, in stock. Uh, sometimes we get two cases in that, but uh, in general, we try to keep them around um, after they've been featured on Wines Day. And you guys can do it at your own leisure or, or whatnot. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much. This is awesome. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, thank my you. guys. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, guys. Good to see you again. Thank you, guys. Good to see you again. You too. Right. <laughs> We'll see everybody in two weeks. Yeah. See everybody in two weeks.